So now we're going to talk about applications of information theory. There are various applications of information theory, but we are going to cover some of them. Uh, first, we're going to uh, cover a bit of uh, what the information theory was invented for, so information density and redundancy, uh, so how it can be, be applied to compression and things like that. And uh, then we're going to uh, cover two uh, topics which are related to security, that is uh, passwords and then how it can be used to estimate uh, uh, how much identifying information is needed uh, to uh, uniquely identify an individual and uh, how this can be used uh, as tracking for, for tracking people. Now, uh, information density and redundancy. So this was uh, a part of Shannon's original paper. So, um, Consider that we have a natural language L. And then we have this uh, random variable P, uh, which produces strings of length N uh, in this language L. Then. So we, we denote the alphabet by PL here. So the, the set of uh, characters in the alphabet. So the entropy of the language L is then defined as uh, edge L here. And that is simply the, the limit of the entropy of this uh, random variable that uh, outputs strings of length n. And then we let the length uh, go uh, to infinity and we divide by n here. So uh, the entropy of a language is uh, the entropy per character uh, in uh, strings of uh, this language. And uh, this can be used to define uh, redundancy of the language L. And this is simply defined as uh, follows. So we have one, which is basically no redundancy, uh, minus uh, the entropy of the language divided by uh, the logarithm of uh, the, the, the alphabet, uh, the size of the alphabet. So we remember this part is the, the maximum entropy uh, that we have. Uh, so of course, if uh, this one uh, would be the maximum entropy, then this would be L, uh, then, then this would, uh, these two would take each other out and become one. So then we have one minus one and we have zero entropy. Uh, but most likely this one will be lower. Uh, so we have redundancy in languages and then this will uh, represent the, the redundancy uh, in language. So let's, let's look at uh, an example here. So as I said, uh, edge of L is the bits per character in the language. So Shannon, he, he did some estimates uh, for himself in, back in 1948 in his paper. And then he estimated that the entropy of English is one to one and a half bits per character. Uh, so if we assume then somewhere in between, so 1.25, uh, then the redundancy in English is approximately one minus uh, 1.25 divided by the logarithm of 26, which is roughly uh, 0 0.73. Uh, so, so quite quite a lot of redundancy in English. Uh, uh, if we uh, continue with some other examples that he had, he, he concluded that uh, for for two-dimensional crossword puzzles, so norm, normal crossword puzzles that you find in newspapers. Uh, this requires a redundancy of approximately uh, 0.5, so 50%. Uh, because if you had no redundancy at all, then basically any combination of characters uh, would be valid. So it would uh, 
be quite easy to do crossword puzzles. No, no challenge because you can just fill them with random characters and it would be totally valid. Uh, but that's not the case. So you want around 50% uh, redundancy for these to, to be meaningful uh, because then any combination of characters will not work uh, due to uh, the redundancy. Another example where uh, redundancy is uh, very visible is these uh, SMS languages. Uh, because the, the redundancy in these SMS languages is much lower than non-SMS languages. So for instance, compare uh, how we write wait in English and how we write wait in, in, on the phone. Uh, so the redundancy is, is much less here. So imagine you, you lose a, a character in, in, in this one, that's not as bad as if you lose a character in, in this one. Uh, so, so lower redundancy, that's of course more space efficient, but it in, that incurs more errors as well. So the reason we have redundancy is that uh, so we can cope with noise. So for instance, if we are out uh, walking somewhere and there is a lot of traffic around and we are talking, then maybe you don't hear every uh, syllable that the other person says, but it still works thanks to the, thanks to the context because that is uh, part of what uh, this redundancy is about. Now, let's uh, proceed to the area of passwords. So back in 2011, there was this paper uh, that uh, analyze, wanted to analyze how, how well uh, different password composition policies affects the passwords that user chooses. Uh, so uh, what they did was they looked at different aspects of passwords individually and then they summarized. So they used the idea that the entropy for uh, different properties of the passwords, uh, so x1 up to xn here, so the, the joint entropy of these properties is less than or equal to uh, the entropy of each property uh, taken by itself and then uh, sum them up. So then they could look at uh, the different, uh, the entropy of the different properties and sum this up uh, to get an estimate of uh, basically uh, an upper bound of the entropy of the passwords that are produced. So for instance, uh, they looked at properties such as length, number and placement of character classes and uh, actual characters. And these are of course not independent. Uh, so this sum will be an upper bound and not the actual entropy. But uh, we're fine with uh, the upper bound because uh, if we have an upper bound, we know that this is the best that can happen. Uh, and if the best that can happen is quite bad, then we, we don't want to uh, spend any more time on it. We, we need to, to solve another problem. So basically the upper bound says that, yeah, we can't do any better. The average uh, tells us how well most users will do. And the lower bound, of course, will provide some guarantees, but that's uh, not really possible. Uh, so if a password policy uh, yields low entropy uh, in, uh, in for, for how, how users uh, choose their passwords, that of course means that it's bad. Uh, on the other hand, if a password policy yields high entropy, that doesn't imply that it's good. Uh, so take a few minutes to, to think about why this is the case. Now, uh, there is a uh, comic strip, uh, XKCD, and occasionally uh, that one 
comes with some, some insightful comics that uh, can be used as nice examples. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, a few years ago, there was this uh, comic uh, strip that you see here uh, about passwords and the password complexity and usability and uh, how hard different passwords are to guess. And uh, they used entropy to, to estimate this. So you see, normally, uh, the, what most people are used to is that they should uh, generate a password like this. This is a secure password. So you choose a, a word, and uh, then you do some uh, common substitutions. You might have uppercase or lowercase. You should add a special character and a number. Uh, so if you if we actually look at this and uh, make an estimate of uh, the entropy in this, so you choose an uncommon uh, word, and uh, that's uh, so XKCD estimates it to to around this uh, men these many bits. Uh, so in in English, uncommon word in English, and then having an uppercase or lowercase that's uh, yeah, one bit of entropy, common substitutions here, that's uh, roughly three bits of entropy. Uh, so a special character, that's four bits of entropy. A numeral, that's three bits of entropy. The order of these two, that's one bit of entropy. So in total, it's, it's roughly 28 bits of entropy if you sum these up. Uh, and uh, that's quite easy for a computer to guess. So his estimate is that it would take three days uh, with 1,000 guesses per second, which is a reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, number of guesses. And he, he argues that, yeah, this type of password is not easy to, to remember. So you really need to work it into your muscle memory uh, to, to uh, remember it well. On the other hand, uh, to, to contrast this one, uh, he has another password policy and that's to, uh, or a password generation technique, and that's to choose four random common words. Uh, and uh, then he estimates it's these many bits of entropy per word uh, that you choose from, since you choose them perfectly at random, which yields uh, 44 bits of entropy. And 44 bits of entropy, 44 bits uh, would take roughly 550 years to guess at 1,000 guesses per second. So considerably much harder to guess in comparison to the first password that we chose. And he argues that it's uh, much easier for humans to remember. And uh, uh, theoretically, uh, if you look at this theoretically, there, there are uh, actually valid points here because here he wanted to choose an uncommon word. And uh, so if you choose an uncommon word, then yeah, you're, you're obviously by definition, not that familiar with it, so you might not have uh, that many associations with it. So, so it's something that uh, is new to you and, and doesn't uh, necessarily have uh, a strong meaning for you. Yeah. And those things are, are difficult for, for humans to remember. And especially since you must also remember uh, a lot of uh, substitutions in different places, uh, which is also individual things. So there are quite a few things that you must remember here. So it's uh, one word that is uncommon. It's the caps lock, it's the substitutions, uh, it's the numeral, which also doesn't have a meaning or shouldn't have a meaning at least, and the special character, which also doesn't have a meaning. So it's quite a few things that you must remember here. Whereas if you go to the other example here, uh, then uh, it's four common words, which actually uh, has a meaning for you since they are common. So, uh, so it's only four things that you must remember. And uh, this type of uh, thing is much easier for humans to, uh, to remember. So that's the, that's the theoretical uh, 
um, background of this. Now, if we uh, look at some numbers uh, ourselves, then uh, if we look at this standard type of password that we, we want to, to generate usually, uh, so we have the, the alphabetic characters, we have uh, 10 numbers, and we, we say that we have 10 special characters. Uh, so this yields, uh, well, we can use upper and lower case characters. So that's two times 26 plus 10 plus 10. And then the logarithm of this, uh, that's roughly six bits of entropy per password character. Uh, and this, this is only the case if we choose each password character uniformly, randomly, independently of each other, okay? So that means that a 10 character uh, password chosen uniformly at random like this uh, contains 60 bits of entropy. Uh, now, what would actually happen if we require that two upper and two lowercase characters and two numbers uh, must be included in this and say a special character as well, uh, which is usually the case. Well, uh, what happens here is that you eliminate a lot of possibilities uh, from this space that you have. So this actually decreases the space, so uh, the entropy would actually be much less than 60 bits uh, once you introduce these requirements in the password policy. So the idea of the password policy is to increase the, uh, the security of the passwords, but uh, theoretically from this point of view, it actually lowers uh, the possibility. Now, uh, if we look at the, the other uh, suggestion that XKCD had, uh, the four word passphrase, then uh, we have 125,000 words in the standard Swedish dictionary. So the logarithm of that is 17 bits. So 17 bits per word. So if we use four word passphrase, and we've chosen these four words independently and uniformly at random from this dictionary, then we would get uh, 68, bit, uh, 68 bits of entropy. So compare that to having to remember 10 things, uh, 10 individual things, uh, no meaningful relation to each other, uh, compared to remembering four things, which have no meaningful relation to each other, then remembering four things is uh, much easier for, for the human mind. Otherwise, you, you need to really work it in. Uh, now, the final example we're, we will cover here is uh, to, to generate a random sentence. Uh, so, uh, you remember from the example from Shannon that he, he estimated that the entropy per uh, character in the English language was approximately 1.25 bits. So, if we generate uh, a completely random but still valid sentence in English, uh, which is uh, 20 characters long, uh, then that would yield only uh, 25 bits uh, of entropy. So that's quite weak, easily to guess, uh, since uh, a lot of uh, options are cancelled because they don't grammatically, they are uh, grammatically incorrect and so on. Now, uh, as I said, and I want to uh, emphasize this again, all these uh, things that we've talked about uh, have required uniform randomness, so uniformly uh, at random. Uh, however, humans, uh, whenever they uh, create random things, uh, they are not really good at this, so they don't choose uh, uh, particularly at random, so the entropy would uh, be much lower actually uh, when a human has chosen it. So, so these are, yeah, we really need to let a computer choose these at random. 
and a computer which has access to good randomness uh, as well. Now, let's proceed to the last part. So, uh, the one about identifying information. So, uh, let's look at uh, an example at first. So, what do we get most information from? Uh, zodiac signs or birthdays? Now, this uh, everyone should, should have some intuition about this. And yeah, obviously the birthday uh, should be it should contain more information. And if we, if we look at this and, and uh, use uh, Shannon Entropy, then we see that, yeah, there's zodiac signs. Uh, there are 12 of those. So the maximum entropy is log, uh, the logarithm of 12, which is roughly 3.58 bits. Uh, whereas there are 365 days of the year and uh, thus the maximum entropy would be uh, the logarithm of 365, so 8.51 uh, bits of entropy. Now, uh, both of these, I say maximum entropy is, uh, has uh, both of these calculations would assume that uh, human births are spread uniformly randomly over the year, uh, but this is not the case, so the entropy would actually be lower. Uh, but uh, it would be, uh, both of these uh, would relate uh, to each other, so, so they, they would still have the, uh, a similar, similar, similar relation. Now, uh, so considering that, um, Think a bit about how much information do we need to uniquely identify an individual. Take a few minutes uh, to think about that. So uh, the answer to the question uh, comes here. So sometime during uh, 2011, there were 6.9 billion people on Earth, according to the World Bank. I'm not sure how they how they reached uh, uh, this particular precision, so so that it ends with 33. Uh, but anyway, that's the number uh, they gave. So we're going to use that one. So what we want to do is to give everyone a unique identifier, and to do that, we need uh, the logarithm of n bits uh, to to code uh, each one. So that's uh, 32.7, so roughly 33 bits uh, we would need for, for this uh, identifier. So if we have that, then every person on Earth could get their own uh, unique identifier. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, probably a bit more, so, so we would need a few more bits. Uh, uh, well, actually, if we add one more bit, that doubles it. So if we are, as long as we are less than uh, 13, 14 billion people, uh, 34 bits of, uh, uh, 34 bits would uh, be sufficient uh, for this identifier. Now, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, they did a study back in 2010 about uh, how much information a web browser shares. And, uh, this area is actually called uh, browser fingerprinting. Uh, so what they do is to, to check what uh, uh, information or data the browser uh, gives away. So these are uh, lots of settings that the website would like to know to adapt. So like your preferred language. So if your preferred language is English, then it would present you a web page in English. Whereas if your preferred language would be Swedish, then maybe they have a Swedish translation available. So they would uh, actually provide you with that. Uh, and then you have uh, various fonts available and uh, the resolution of your screen and things like that. So they can adapt uh, the web page to, to look the best on, on your system. And all these settings uh, will vary from person to person or browser to browser. Uh, so actually maybe 
there are enough variations uh, in these settings so that we can uniquely identify uh, individuals. So to, to estimate this, they, they, made a, they developed a service, Panopticlick, uh, which actually estimates how many, how many bits of entropy that uh, your browser gives away. And there is also another service uh, called Am I Unique, which is run by uh, another research team who, who does research on uh, browser fingerprinting. So you, you should try both of these and uh, see how well you, you do. Uh, I ran this with my browser. Uh, I think this was like the, the first or second generation of Panopticlick. I think they are in the third generation of Panopticlick now. And when I did this test uh, with uh, all add-ons that I had, which are privacy, uh, privacy enhancing add-ons, then it gave me uh, 21.45 bits of entropy. Uh, so that's uh, not that far from the 34 bits uh, of entropy that we actually needed uh, to uniquely identify every individual on Earth. And by that time, they had tested uh, 2.8 million users. Uh, so, uh, so you should uh, see how well you do. Another uh, add-on that you could try is Collusion for, for Firefox. Probably it's available for, for Chromium as well. And that's a browser add-on which uh, keeps track of trackers. So, and uh, it can give you this uh, nice graph here, which shows you all the, the different trackers that it has encountered. So you have Google here, and uh, here we have Facebook. Now uh, in this picture, you, you don't really see the, the connections between these, but there are small lines between these. So uh, you can actually see uh, which uh, the, the entire tracking network uh, that is tracking you as you surf around the web. And these, of course, use this, uh, well, they use different techniques, but uh, they can use the, the browser fingerprint uh, to track you across services so that know, they know that uh, you are you and can see uh, what you like to, to watch and what you like to do uh, around the web. And that was everything for this time. Uh, thanks a lot.